All right, everyone. Uh, very good morning. Very good evening. Right. So let's start with this second demo classes for this rack batch. Uh, as you can see my screen, I'm going to keep it simple today. Uh, I'm going to try to cover as much as possible. I plan to cover these seven topics for today. Uh, let's see if we can able to accommodate all these seven. That's well and good. Otherwise, whatever possible, we can cover it. Uh, before I can get started with this today's topic, uh, anyone has any questions, queries in our yesterday's class or uh, anything you would like to ask or clarify, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your questions. And also use the chat box. You can, you can ping here in the chat as well. Right, I can give 10 seconds or 20 seconds Oh, feel free to ask any questions if you have it. Otherwise, I can get started. All right, I'll take it as a no. Oh, yeah, if you can see, these are the seven topics I'm going to cover it for today. One is uh, with ASM and without ASM. Uh, many of us still have a confusion why ASM is needed. I'm going to form my cluster where using two nodes. My database instance will be running on two nodes and my database will be sitting on the shared storage. And then why we need ASM on top of that, right? So in prayer to 10G, what used to happen? There's a ASM home, right? And then there's a cluster home. ASM home separately we used to install and cluster home separately we used to install. And then uh, this cluster where software, whatever we used to install, this used to be like uh, your, which is going to help us to form cluster, right? Whatever the two node cluster, three node cluster, which used to help us form the cluster. And this ASM home will help us to form a uh, storage uh, solution and some of the other concept of uh, your, um, what you can say, uh, okay, I can get it here. Your logical value manager or your other advantages. Like, let's get it here. Let's draw it here and then you can understand more. Right. In prior to 10G, what used to happen, like we used to install something like ASM home. So that will be something like U01 19G or like U01 ASM underscore home. And then cluster home, we used to install separate software of our cluster home, like U01 and cluster. And then database home, like U01 DB home underscore one. And then on top of this database home, we used to create database here. So we used to install three softwares in order to form a two node cluster. If I can say this is node one, and then this is node two, node one and node two. In order to form this two node cluster, we used to install ASM home separately. We used to install cluster home separately, we used to install DB home separately, three homes here and three homes here. And this cluster home used to form this two node cluster, cluster communication, and then node one and node two, uh, all the information exchange, like this is the main software, which used to form this cluster. And then this ASM home is for providing your ASM features, like, you know, your mirroring, striping, and, um, uh, your uh, uh, data storage, your, in order to store your, uh, this database, whatever the DB1, DB2 instance, these two instance to store the data, ASM used to provide that storage solution. And along with the storage solution, it used to provide some other feature like your ACFS, mirroring, striping, and logical value manager, and all those things, right? So these are the three software we used to install in 10G, prior to 10G release two. And starting with the, 10G release two, what happened? Oracle has combined this ASM software 
and the cluster software and they call it as a grid software right now what we are doing instead of two softwares we are going to install something called grid software grid home we are going to install something called grid home u01 grid and then we are going to install just oracle home right starting with 10g released onwards we are just installing two software grid software and db home and what is this grid software this grid software is nothing but combination of your asm home plus your cluster home combining together they came up with something called a grid that's a starting with your 10g release too we're going to install just a grid software here grid software here and followed by db software and db software and then we're going to install this database home Again, this grid software is nothing but combination of your ASM home plus cluster home. So cluster home is to form a two node cluster, three node cluster, and all the cluster communication, all the clustering will be done with this particular cluster software. And ASM home is for to provide you ASM storage in order to keep your database in ASM, your ASM will help on that. In order to communicate your database instance with the ASM storage, so your ASM home or ASM libraries will help on that. So starting with 11G release 2, grid is single binary we're going to install, which contain both your cluster and ASM home, right? So that's a simple understanding why we need a ASM home or why we need a grid home. People will call it as nowadays, my ASM home, my cluster home, my grid home, whatever they call it, it's all one and same. If they say ASM home, if they say cluster home, if they say grid home, all are like one and same. So quickly I can show you here in my lab, right? If I do cat etc or a tab, right? So this is my cluster home. If I go inside that, right? So it's all your cluster software, including your ASM software. Combining together, we can call it as a grid. So that's a naming convention. That's a grid software, right? So it has all the binaries, whatever needed for cluster communication and to form a cluster. And also it has all the binaries, libraries and executable in order to provide your ASM storage in order to keep your database in a shared storage. But these are the two major uh, tasks provided by your grid. One is a cluster, uh, forming a cluster and other one is your ASM storage in order to keep your database in a shared disk group. And on top of that, there are other advantages or other feature with the ASM or a grid or a cluster that mirroring, striping, and all those things will be provided by your grid software. All right, let's clear this one. Uh, go back here. All right, so with the ASM and without the ASM, how your software stack look like? You have your operating system, and then these two, whatever I'm highlighting here, right? Right. So this is your file system and your logical value manager. Each file system, in order to manage your file system, there should be a one logical value manager. Whatever you're seeing here, this logical value manager. This logical value manager, LVM, is mandatory in order to manage your file system. So if I can go here uh, on this particular on this particular Oracle Lab One PS F E F Grab S one. So I have my DevDB. See Oracle dot INV SQL plus slash S D B. Select name from V dollar database. So sorry, select name from V dollar database as a data file. Right. So these are your data files: system, sysox, undo, users. So these all are sitting in the inside your OS file system. Right. If I can go here, right, u zero one app, Oracle, Vara data, DevDB data file, and if I do LS and LTR, all these files are available here. In order to manage these files, you need a OS logical value manager. As you can see in this screen here, 
whatever the file system which resides under your operating system in order to manage that you need a logical value manager and if you are using a file system from your nas san or netapp or, or netonix or whatever the vendor those vendor will manage that file system using their logical value manager here two things one is the file system should be provided by your third party vendor and the logical manager also will be provided by third party vendor in order to manage this cost right so this is a third party cost logic file system and logical manage vlmr like these these two cost is you know bared by you you have to pay for third party vendor for san or nas or netapp or netonix whatever the vendor you have to provide a cost in order to manage a file system or in order to manage those uh, logical value manager so in order to replace that dependency about the storage asm is came into picture you just need to install your asm asm will act as your file system to store the data and also asm will manage those data files or the whatever the file you are going to store it inside asm so replacement of your file system plus logical value manager is nothing but your asm storage right if i can go back to my rack system here dot or inv plus dev db1 sql plus slash yes i'm connecting to one of my node one here where is my database is it down i think yesterday we brought it down right it's all down i'll go to node 2 right so psf and ef grep s1 i'm going to set it to node 2 sql plus slash s yes, db select name from v dollar data file right so you can see same files system sysocks undo users all are available inside my data disk group and you can see if you observe it is starting with a plus plus indicate that's your disk group that disk group is provided by your asm so now i'm going to set the environment to plus asm to and then i'll go inside my asm storage asm cmd and p lsdg list disk group so i have my lsdg so i have my data ocr and reco three disk groups and with the different different sizes and if i can go inside my data and you can see it is in plus data so if i can go to dev db data files if i can go to dev db and cd if i can go to data file ls and l so i can see all the data files but all these data files are available on my asm disk group so your asm will act as a storage provider and also asm will act as your logical value manager in order to manage these files so that's a simple understanding what's the advantages of asm asm will avoid dependency on the file system and dependency on the logical value manager which is managed by your storage vendor or any third party software so that's a major advantage and on top of that uh, accessing a file from your asm when a database reads or writes a data files inside asm which is, which is much more faster than accessing a file in the file system in the os file system and what that mean like i have database 1 database 2 in order to read or in order to write or like write or read from the file system the io the input output whatever the read operation write operation which will be like costlier means costlier in the sense it will be like time consuming but accessing the same thing reading and writing a data from the asm disk group which will be like faster right and then because of that oracle always recommends to use asm rather than your file system right that's one thing and other advantages of asm is it will provide mirroring and striping and acfs and then so many other other uh, benefits right that's a simple understanding of why we need a asm without asm can i form my cluster yes you can form your cluster using a shared file system and all but that is not uh, optimal solution 
ASM is the highly recommended solution in order to use your clusterware, use your cluster database or form your cluster database. Right, so that's the first point what I wanted to cover with ASM and without ASM, why we need ASM. So again, simple understanding, ASM is act like your storage solution and your logical value manager. On top of that, other features of your ASM are your mirroring, striping, SGFS file system, and also accessing the data uh, from your ASM disk group is much more faster. Right. Hello. That's a, mm -hmm. Sir, can you give one uh, example for mirror and uh, striping in real time environment? Like when mm -hmm. do we need to use it? Mirror and striping, again, if I go right now, it will be much more deeper, but I can give you one simple uh, example for mirroring. Um, Okay, I can go here. Let's go here. All right, so what happens in the mirroring? All right, so I can go with here. I can form here plus data. Right, this is my plus data disk group, what you're seeing it here, right? So whatever you're seeing here, uh, this plus data ASM disk group, that's your uh, ASM disk group. And now you can have something like this. I can say, I'll form that, right? So with this eight disk, with this disk one, two, three, four, five, six, I'm gonna form that data disk group. Whatever you're seeing this data disk group here, this data disk group is made up of four disk and if you write some data here assuming that you're going to write data a and automatically based upon what type of mirroring you have two-way mirroring and three-way mirroring we have it normal redundancy and high redundancy the moment you write data a here and automatically the duplicate copy is written here and the moment you write data b here automatically duplicate data is written here so that is called mirroring two copies that is called normal mirroring and high mirroring. Uh, normal mirroring means normal redundancy and high redundancy. So normal it redundancy is like is a, is multiplexing. It is not multiplexing. Multiplexing is you're keeping the file level, but it's a internal how data is managed. Yeah. High redundancy is three copies. So it's kind of uh, in case of if this particular disk corrupted, you still have one more copy. Right, you can go with the two copies or three copies, normal redundancy or high redundancy. And that's your mirroring. Similarly, there's the striping. Striping is nothing but like, if you want to write something in the same scenario here, like if you want to write A, B, C, D, you want to write A, B, C, D. So Oracle will divide this data into stripes and then you're gonna write across A, B, C, D. That is your striping. At the same time, it's gonna mirror the data a b c d so that is your striping so if you don't do this striping what happens if you write a b c d and then all the data is going to write it here a b c d all the a b c d data is going to write it on one disk and your io will be slow here like it has to go with a followed by b followed by c and followed by d it has to write sequentially that's going to take a lot of time consuming Rather than that, whatever this ABCD, it's gonna divide ABCD as the stripes. And at the one shot, IO will be used, like four IO will be used. And then on all four disks, A is going to write here, B is writing here, C is writing here, D is writing here. In one single write, on all of the disk, your ABCD will be written as a stripes. But if you don't do a striping, you have to wait for sequentially. Your data has to write A followed by B, followed by C and followed by D. So that is a, lot of time consuming. So striping is going to help for faster reading and writing the data. Mirroring will gonna help you for redundancy. In case of one particular disk fails, you have other data mirrored copy, right? So that's a simple understanding for your uh, with ASM and without ASM and what are the other advantages of your ASM. All right. Okay. Right now, coming back to type of databases, 
um, you have standalone database and standalone database, we can call it as a single instance or you can call it as a Oracle restart. And then you have a Rack database and then you have Rack one node. Right, you have typically you can see three types of databases, but in first standalone you have a single and Oracle restart. So combining all together, you can say four types of databases. Right, standalone and rack and rack one node. So in standalone you have a single instance or the Oracle restart. So combining all together, I can say four types of databases. So what are those four types of databases why we need? Right, I can say this is one and this is two and this is three. So standalone, whatever you're seeing here, Oracle Lab 1, PSF and F, Grab S1, and whatever this DevDB without ASM, which is storing under locally, Right, that's called your standalone database. Right, I can say Oracle Lab One example is here. Oracle Lab One and DevDB. So this is your standalone database. So it's like single instance running on that particular server. And in case of that server goes down, this whatever Oracle Lab One server, whatever the server goes down due to some network or some OS issue, and your DB will be down. Right? and your data will be stored under local storage. And now we have a separate database called Oracle Restart. I'm gonna connect one more server here. Root. Great. So again, if you can see Oracle Lab 2, this is my Oracle Lab 2 other server. Oracle Lab 2, and if I do PSF and EF grab PSMON, I have plus ASM installed here. And then I have my test DB, dev CDB database running here. So if I can go to my test CDB here. SQL plus class as sysdba, select file or select name from V dollar data file. Right, you can see my test CDB running under my ASM disk group. So I have my ASM instance running here, standalone ASM installation here. So you are gonna install the ASM on the single server and you're gonna run your database under that ASM storage. So that is your Oracle Lab 2 and your database name is here, testdb. So same concept here, your Oracle Lab 2 and Oracle Lab 1, both are single server and both are single databases. But here we can call it as a single instance. For this Oracle Lab 1, for this DevDB, I can call it as a single instance. And same thing for Oracle Lab 2, same database. I'm running it as a, calling it as a, Oracle restart because this is without ASM and then this is with ASM. And why I'm calling this as a Oracle restart? What's the advantage? And advantage is that your ASM, what that means ASM, as I said, if this server Oracle Lab one goes down due to some network issue or due to some storage issue or due to some OS issue. And once after this Oracle Lab one comes online, this database will never come online. It's a DBA job. He has to bring it up. All the listeners, all the services, all the databases, whatever running under this Oracle Lab one, everything manually DBA has to bring it up. If it's a midnight and if your server went down or database went down due to some network issue and it's a DBA job, you have to get up in the midnight and you have to start all the services. But whereas in Oracle restart, the name itself says restart, your ASM will take care of that. 
even if your db goes down your due to some network issue os issue or storage issue your asm will bring it up automatically you no need to sit down and you no need to bring all your listener services databases and all asm will take care of that that's where the name called restart for quick example smon so this is my test db i'm quickly kill this instance kill minus 9 i'm going to kill this database test cdb and you can see your test cdb is gone now right and you can wait for a few more second automatically your uh, test db will come up i can wait for a few more minute right you can see your db is back online so it's applicable to not only db all your listener all your services whatever it is your asm will take care of that so in stand alone asm when you install we have something called ha high availability so that's a built in feature with your asm and that will take care of that if any instance goes down or due to some network or os or whatever reason so automatically it'll going to bring it up it doesn't matter whether it's a midnight or whatever it is so that's where we can call it as a oracle restart and if i can well, go to node 1 and if i can kill this devdb here kill minus 9 and if i kill this devdb this will never come online so it's a dba job you have to manually go ahead and then start the database right that's the advantage between your single instance in the stand alone single instance and oracle restart at any question on this malik uh, this could also be a rack database right because it contains asm but how to differentiate between rack and oracle restart your stand alone will be just plus asm okay. and if it case of rack it will be asm 1 and 2 and 3 okay. it will be like okay node 2 is down and node 1 is down exit psfnf grep smon so in case of rack it will be plus asm 1 2 3 4 like that if it's a stand alone it's just like plus asm oh uh, so do we need all those ips in case of oracle restart we need like do we do we need those ips vip no 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 ips here just one ip okay. as i said like stand alone stand alone whatever needed same thing needed here just a single ip oh, for that server yes. all right so that is a simple understanding right when uh, stand malik. alone single instance or restart yeah yeah hi malik uh, i have a doubt is if we install any database on the uh, single node database on the as yes, uh, like that you said na if we kill the database instance automatically yeah. it will restart Right. After the restart, the database uh, stays in in the read write mode. Yes, 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 yes. It's read write mode. Read write mode. Yeah. Okay. So for if uh, regarding this, we need to in at the installation time we need to enable any feature. No. The moment you install your ASM, that's more than enough. ASM is mandatory there. And if I can do cat etc or a tab, you can see I have my ASM software installed here. That's your grid software. followed by your database so so this feature was came from the uh, any 11g or the 12c software onwards sir it is part of your asm part of your grid no 11g no okay Every, uh, uh, all all asm versions this feature was enabled all right that's correct okay thank you right so this mm -hmm. server node and instance are all same server node instance In instance is your okay. database server yeah. and node or your os or your server or your uh, host name okay uh, in rack and rack whatever it is instance means it's related to your database instances server okay. and nodes are your host okay so i see in like uh, in rack they call it as instance okay. instance is again database Okay, where so. you call your instances it's your database instances and nodes are the host or the servers or your linux boxes okay okay thank you right so that's about stand alone two types single instance or oracle restart and what's the advantage of oracle restart the restart feature 
right? And coming to rack, again, name itself suggests rack database. So we'll be having node one, node two, my instance node one and node two, and my database instance one will be running here, database instance two will be running here. If I install third node, my database instance three will be running here, but all these three database, all these three instance, your database will be here. D is the database. And for that D1, D2, D3 is your instance. So it will be running on multiple nodes, right? That's a simple, like I can quickly show here. Uh, like I can say multiple nodes, right? So I can say multiple nodes like uh, node one and node two. I can just give it as a node one and node two. And I can say here dev db, dev db instance one will be running here, dev db instance two will be running here, and this dev db instance one and instance two. So whereas same thing here, it will be asm one will be running on this node one, and your asm two will be running on this node two. Right. So if I can quickly start here my asm instance on node one because yesterday we brought it down right. Plus ASM one CR CTL dot CRS. Right, I can quickly so the moment you do CRS CTL start CRS, it'll automatically start. So I'm just gonna forcefully start my ASM instance. Right, uh, I'll go to node two. Like I have this ASM instance two and I have this JDB two. So ASM instance two is running on node two, right? It is my host node two. And in that node two, I'm, I have my ASM instance two. I have my JDB uh, instance two will be running here. And at the same time on node one. Okay, so let's connect back here. Dot or INV plus ASM. SQL plus slash as this ASM. Okay, it's already started. PSF and EF, grep SMON. Right, so your ASM one is started here because of this CRS CTL start CRS. And the moment your ASM is back online, automatically it's gonna bring your database instance online. You can see your database also came online. Right, so you were node one, instance database instance one will be running node two database instance two will be running and you have ESM one and ESM two will be running here if you start node three and you can start your third database instance and there will be third ASM instance will be running that is your typical rack database right multiple instances and then coming to this rack one node it's a special kind of a, a, what I can say here, I can say here running on multiple nodes, running on multiple nodes, I can say here running on single nodes, single node, even though has it has multiple nodes. So that's the difference between rack database and rack one node database. Here, your database instance will be running on multiple nodes, like instance one and instance two, node one and node two, it's running on multiple nodes at the same time. Rack one node name indicates one node. It's a rack database, but it's a one node. What that means, running on a single node, even though, sorry, even though it has a multiple nodes. For example, I can just take this as an example here. All right, so your this will not be running here. Right, so it will be just running one instance, dev db, but second node instance will not be running here. If in case of this node goes down and automatically your instance two will start and then your instance one will be down. So rack one node, the meaning of that is at any given time,
time i am going to start on only one instance right so the naming convention will be quite uh, different instead of one and two here it will be like underscore one and it will be underscore two here right so it will be like underscore the moment you see in your any of the client environment it will be having underscore one and underscore two that typically indicates it's a rack one node rack one node means at any given point of time it will run on one single node if that node goes down and automatically that other instance will be started on the other existing node uh, so sir it is like active passive configuration it's not active passive it's always active but only one will be running so you can say that active that? yeah you can say that active passive in in, in simple words so malik uh, so what's the benefit over like you know in the rack database like you know if i have a rack one one node and rack database right so if we have two nodes already it's better mm -hmm. to have both the instance right yeah, that's uh, if you have both rack database and running on both the nodes, it's the biggest advantage. But why you need a rack one node? But I'll tell you why. Um, if you have some pre prod environment, like you have, I can say, three node cluster, and your UAT one will be running here, your UAT two will be running here, your UAT uh three will be running here so what um people will do okay rather than running three instances let's go with the uat one and two on first two nodes and then one of the development database dev one start it on third node so that it will put only load on node three and it will not interfere with my uat testing right so if you start your uat here and then this particular third node will be like overloaded because you're going to running two instances here. So that's one of the use case. I don't want to lose this database as well as I don't want to interfere this database with my UAT load. So I can run my UAT drivers on node one and two. Third node, I can use it for my dev or my test. Like people will configure for whatever reason they want, right? So it is like not having given downtime. It will be having a high availability feature and also it will not be interfering with your UAT load. Yeah, is the, is it using the same Oracle binary for a rack one node yeah. and a rack two? Same binaries. Okay, so basically, if you shut down the shut down the instance, right? Like you know, it will. It's yeah, the moment you shut down this instance, and you can start it on the other nodes. Okay. Right. But that's a simple understanding. Underscore one, wherever you see, that's a typical naming convention, but you can give whatever name you want. Right, that's a second point, types of databases. If somebody asks, typically three types, standalone, rack, rack or node. In standalone, again, two types, uh, single instance or the Oracle restart, four types of database altogether. Right, uh, coming back to again, uh, any any questions here so far? Rack types of database or ASM or without ASM? Uh, how to find how many uh, nodes are configured in the server, like in the rack database? OLS, OLS, OLS nodes. In your rack environment, you can just type OLS nodes. Uh, let's exit with the root user. Dot or INV plus ASM, OLS nodes. The moment you turn, write your OLS nodes, you're gonna see it's a two node cluster. Oh. Is, yeah. is this the same command for a, a rack uh, single node, rack one node? No, these commands will not work. Okay. So single node, the... again, as I said, right? The moment you see plus ASM, it's yeah. a single node. Okay. Right, plus ASM, one, two, three will start for your rack, but single node just plus ASM. Uh, no, uh, Malik, I'm not talking about uh, uh, what is the uh, Oracle restart. I'm talking about uh, rack, uh, rack one node. Rack is one node? No, rack one node, again, as I said, your basic underlying architecture is rack. Like you should okay. have your rack cluster should be formed. Okay. And on top of that, whether you want to run your rack database 
or whether you want to run your rack one node doesn't matter but underlying architecture rack is mandatory here how many two node rack three node rack four node rack the architecture will be rack but you are running okay. instance only one node or you are running instance on all three nodes if you run okay. instance on all three nodes it's a rack database if you run only instance on one node that's rack one node but the okay. question should be your question should be how i can identify whether it's a rack one node or rack database ah oh, yes right so that you can do it here i can give you here one command um give me a second here okay mm. okay open okay i don't have it here i have it here okay i can open one more lab here give me a second okay okay here it is okay i can connect to one more server here and i can this one more cluster two node cluster again i'm going to connecting here root right and then here root right and this cluster it has a node sorry it has a node two here and psf and ef grep smon and you can see a lot of database will be running here and a node one also psf and ef grep smon a lot of database will be running here some are rack or some are stand alone or some are single instance and all okay um, again dot var env plus asm1 i'll do ols nodes and it's a two node cluster node one and node two okay and if you see this is the rack var 90c there is no one or two this is just a single instance and you can see this is a single it's just a single instance no rack nothing and if you see if you observe this one rack 12c instance one cdb instance one var prod instance one var db instance one these are like one instance running on node one if i can go to other node and var db2 var prod2 cdb2 and these are your rack databases and the second instances but if you can see here rack one node underscore two your rack one node database running on second instance if it is shut down here if you can go to node one it will be like rack one n underscore one so that will be get changed and you can validate one more command like you can set the environment to dot var env dot var env and you can set this instance here srv ctl config database hyphen d and you can give your database name rack 1n the moment you run this command srv ctl config database and services rack node and then where is the one node okay here type rack one node okay so the moment you run this command srv ctl config database it's going to say that whether it's a rack one node or rack database if i can check it for this one or a db2 dot or inv srv ctl config or a db and type of this database is type of the database is rack database so by just using this srv ctl command you can get to know whether it's a rack database or whether it's a rack one node database can rack one node uh, can be configured in rack database rack one node can be configured rack means i mean i see the uh, uh, rack one node i mean rack one node and uh, one node db and uh, rack are configured in the same server yeah you can do that one right that's a use case i told okay right that's so, a uh, mm -hmm. so when, like uh, there will be always a backup of for a rack or node one that rack node and if that rack node one uh, rack node one goes down there will be another node to uh, backup right? it's not a backup it's your cluster underlining two node cluster three node cluster four node cluster okay. and one your database will be running on database instance will be running on one node if that okay. node goes down if the cluster down it will automatically switch to other instance other server other node other host okay 
right you can see here again uh, rack one node but okay. it'll be part of node one node two you are all the oh. cluster nodes if node one goes down it'll go to node two if node two goes down it'll go to node three whatever the cluster node it will switch to there okay right running instance it will be right now second instance is running and okay. if it is shut down it will go to node one and the instance one will run okay so rack node will be always part of a rack uh, it's always part of rack rack is mandatory without rack you cannot possible rack again as i said if you see here stand alone is for single instance your rack and rack one node for your rack cluster okay. not for the stand alone okay Thank you. Uh, hello, Mali. Yeah. Uh, in the rack single node, uh, one one instance is active and another instance is inactive. It Correct? will shut down. Uh, oh, shut down. Yes. Uh, whenever whenever first instance will be go down, then the second will be uh, up and automatically users will uh, remap to the second instance. This right. is the process. Correct? Right. So That's regarding right. this, uh, we have any feature to convert uh, rack single node to the rack uh, multiple node. Uh, after installing uh, if we are uh, working on the rack single node any the, feature there is a there's a there's a instance you need to add it uh, once you add both instances and it become a rack database you can convert rack one node as a rack or rack as a rack one node vice versa okay. you can do whatever you want okay so uh, in the rack uh, in the rack multiple node also uh, in our p file cluster database equal to true we are using the same feature in the rack single node and the rack uh, yeah multiple we are using the same cluster database equal to true is mandatory okay okay right but only one configuration you can convert rack to uh, your rack one node or rack one node to rack you have to convert that one so this feature was still we can able to use in current uh, versions on the 19c or 12c version 19c 12c 11g 10g you can use wherever you want these are like basic feature what i'm talking about today okay but uh, what is the benefit of uh, rack node because uh, rack database also does the same thing what the rack I, I told you right like you can differentiate your loads like you have a three node cluster and you can run your UAT instance one here, UAT instance two here, and you can run your development instance one here or test instance one here on the third node. So they will be always running on third node. It'll not be interfering with your UAT databases, okay. right? And then I don't want, like I want this to be run with one single instance. I can run it here. At the same time, I want that high availability feature. If this node goes down or if this database instance goes down due to some reason, automatically it should start here. Right, so okay. you can get your high ability feature, and also you will not be interfering with your any of your UAT loads. Right, you will be having separate node for that. Sir, and license part, sir, actually Oracle license. Yeah, it's the same me. same license. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah, like let's quickly start about again cluster base, and uh, um, rack architecture. And then followed by rack networking. So again, we talked about this rack networking yesterday. We will talk about uh, one more time. And then we'll we'll talk about why scan why VIP. Uh, I can quickly go to my slide here. Same thing what we explained yesterday. Uh, right. So whatever you're seeing, this green color, right? These are your public network. Right, public network where you can access it from anywhere, right? That's a public network. Your scan VIPs in public network, your node physical IPs, your node VIPs are in public, and again, node physical IP, node private IP, node the VIPs all are in public network. Whatever you can see, red color here, this one and this one, these are your private network that we use. This particular network is used for node intercommunication. Right, so we can see this is starting with subnet two dot and two dot. Remaining all subnet one, one, one dot, one dot, one dot, all are like one dot. Right, whatever you're seeing the same subnet, all are like in public network. And whatever you're seeing this different subnet, that will be private network, that will be used for only internode communication. Right, and then uh, if the client one comes, he's gonna go to scan from the scan scan will route that connection to either node one or node two based upon the load client two comes 
again scan will route it to node 2 scan 3 comes and then route it to node 1 again scan 4 comes and then you want to route it to node like based upon scan will be aware of where is your load how much node 1 will be having 40 percent of node and node will be node 2 will be having only 10 percent of load so your scan will be intelligent enough to get that load on that particular cluster node if the client 5 comes and you know route the connection here and then client 6 comes and then your scan will route the connection to your node 2 and seventh client comes and again you're going to route the connection to node 2 because your node 1 only two connections are there they itself they are running a huge queries and they are putting a lot of load on that on that node 40 percent load is available here and here only 10 percent even though i have multiple connections so whatever the further connection comes your scan intelligently route that all the connection to node 2 to make this as a 40 percent and once this node 2 also become 40 percent then again connection will be distributed across all the cluster nodes right that's a scan future now mm -hmm. i have a question uh, how do you configure your clients do you what scan ip address do you give them i'm just going to give the scan vip i'll not give any of this i'll just give this scan the scan is intelligent enough to route this three connections if you can go so here scan. i'll show you that one cat etc hosts so if you see my scan here sorry my scan here host scan this is the same, same name host scan host scan like same name but i can see three ips associated to same name ns lookup right the moment i do ns lookup for this client the scan and i'm getting 92 as a first reference if i run the same command now i'm getting 94 if i run second command now i'm getting 93 so your client whatever this client comes here they're going to use this scan name how i'm using here this scan name here this is my scan name the client is going to use this scan name but they're not aware of these ips so you were there what is this ms lookup command what does it do actually that will resolve your scan name with ip address okay. right so the client will be only aware of scan scan again yesterday asked somebody it, it scan stands for a single client access name single client access name means for the client i'm just giving my scan name i'm gonna go i'm gonna give the scan name here host scan client will not be aware of any of these ips right so that internally client one comes this ip will use client two comes the second ip will use third comes the third ip will use that's where the name it says single client access name so for the client it will be just a single name but internally it will be like spread across multiple ips right that's uh, uh that's how the scan internally like how that name will be resolved scan name will be resolved with multiple ips right so that's uh, how your scan works but again the question comes why these many ips i have physical ips i have a vips i have a scan ips why these many ips uh, the reason behind that is for example i can say here uh, what i can say take it here this example for the client right you need to give uh, do i have that uh, wait a second hmm. okay let's take this as an example okay this is looks good now uh this is for scan and then i'll go with the vips here give me a second okay this is vips ah too many permits
physical ip i'll remove this ip host host one host two right uh, let's understand what happens why these many ips came into picture okay this client comes for this client i'm going to give this tns details the node physical ip this physical IP, I'm going to give it to this client. This client is going to use this node physical IP. We want to connect to Oracle or whatever the development, DevDB. Assume that this Oracle has a DevDB. Then here, 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 okay. Here and here, okay. So this client, whatever the client want, he is going to use this a physical node IP, right? For to connect like host one, host two. He's gonna use this or like make it as a node one and node two. Node one, node two. But again, you can make it here also, node one. Node two. And then here you can just make it as a scan. If the client, this client uses this node IP and then say this client connected to this node, go back here, sorry. For that miss, okay. C3 and then C4, right. So if this client comes, if this client uses that node IP, he can directly connect to node. Just assume that I'm just giving you, it will not happen, but if he uses this uh, particular node IP and then he can directly connect to that node, right? You can, I can put it side by side here. Right, so, and then I'm using here load balance equal to S. So that means if this client uses this connection, this TNS connection, if he uses, the first connection will go to node one using that physical IP. And if the server goes down, as we talked yesterday, the physical IP will go down, right? The physical IP will go down and physical IP goes down, this client connection will be broken. This will not be failed over to here because that is he connected via physical IP, right? That's a node name, right? He's using a physical IP, that's not advisable client should not use the physical IP. Again, second client comes, he uses the same thing and load balance equal to S. The second, his connection will go to second node. But again, he's gonna use the physical IP, node two physical IP. Again, if this second node goes down and his connection also broken, as we know, these physical IPs are tagged to that interface. If the server goes down, those IP will go down. So how we can avoid that? We can avoid using of VIPs, right? So this client comes, he will use this VIP connection now. Right, you can see node one VIP, node two VIP, and load balance equal to S. So the client comes, he will connect to node one via VIP now. And in case if this node goes down, your physical IP will go down, but your VIP will never go down as we talked yesterday, right? This VIP will be like floating on your cluster and this VIP will be shifted to node two and this client connection will be automatically connected to node two. That issue is resolved now. So client can use VIP, he can do that load balancing. He can do that a TFA, transparent application failover, right? So this VIP, he can easily connect and he can easily, the application failover will be achieved. Then why we need a scan? Scan is needed, assume that like, Right now, my business is running fine. I'm using two node cluster here. And after, after two to three years, 
right now i have only two node cluster my business is growing i am going to add a new node right now it become a three node cluster now i need to inform my client boss like i have added one more node to my cluster can you add one more entry here in your tns file node 3 right and then he has to manually add that node 3 details into the tns files whatever he is using and if the clients are hundreds thousands of clients we need to communicate to all the clients okay can you guys add this third node details into your tns names that's a tedious manual effort and after one more year my business is again going i'm going to add one more cluster node it become four node again i need to go to thousands of hundreds of clients boss can you add my node four information into your tns file so that you know load will be distributed across all the nodes right so manual effort every time when you add a node delete a node we need to modify the tns entry across all the client connections that's become a tedious how we can avoid that right for that we came up with this scan name what that scan name does your scan name we're going to give the scan name to client that's a single name to client and client can connect to scan from scan we're going to connect to node one or node two via that vip for the client now doesn't matter whether you are running with a two node cluster or three node cluster or four node cluster or five node cluster your scan is smart or intelligent enough to identify what are my cluster nodes and right now running with the two node cluster and my client is using scan name via scan name he can connect to node one or node two via vip and tomorrow i'm going to add one more cluster node i don't need to inform my client because client is using a single name your scan is smart enough to identify what are my cluster nodes and route the connection to my cluster nodes that's the advantages of scan over a vip and what's the advantages of vip over a physical ip and that's how the oracle cluster were evolved first they came up with just a physical ip concept later in uh, i think 10g release one or 9g they they came up with the vip concept and after that to avoid that manual effort of editing the tns name and all they came up with a scan single client access name so irrespective of uh, without knowing a client i can add or modify or delete a cluster nodes i am not going to impact anything on my client side he's just going to use scan name right so that's the advantage of your vip over a physical ip and that's the advantage of your scan ip over a vip right any any questions on question. Yeah, I have a yes. good question. Yep. Sorry. So for the scan, there are three IP, right? Let's say we have four cluster. Now only three IPs are there, right? So how the scan is going to know the load balance for the fourth instance? Again, like I will talk about once we start about uh, our actual class. Uh, there's a something called uh, your each instance. There's a PMON and each instance PMON. The PMON process will be communicating with your scan and PMON process will tell, okay, how many connections are connected to my instance one and it will register with my your scan. The PMON process of your instance two will register that load balance details with your scan. So scan is knows the node one, how many connections are there, node two, how many connections are there. With the help of PMON, your scan will be get to know what's the load on that node. So will it also keep track of the parallel trade also? Whatever it is, yes, it will want to take. Your PMON okay. is the one which is going to help that load balancing. The PMON is going to register all the load details with your scan. Okay. Right. Any Only, questions? Yes. Um, uh, Sada, uh, the scan, uh, as I am seeing in the picture, uh, the scan is part of node one or part of node two? It's a part of cluster. It's not respect to node. So it will sit on in the cluster, right? Okay. That, the cluster will sit. The cluster will occupy both node one and node two, or whatever nodes we have under the cluster. Right. It that's will correct. spread on all the nodes, the cluster. Right. That's correct. Okay. Cluster is nothing but combination of your servers, right? Just okay. Generic understanding. Cluster is the one to combine your one, two, three server and make a form of cluster. And to manage that cluster, there will be resource will be running. Your scan is one of the cluster resource. 
and VIPs are your cluster resource, right? And then those resource can run on either node one or they can run on node two or they can run on node three. Those are cluster resource run on any of your cluster nodes. Okay, okay. Okay, uh, is there any way I can tell the scan to move the traffic or connection to a particular node? Like, can particular. I control, can the, administrate, can the administrator control the scan no. activities? Like no. I can tell that, that go to the node no. one. Itself. No, I cannot. Okay, in case if I feel that, uh, I feel that the load needs to always go to the node one itself. I don't want it that to uh, work on the node two because of some reason, uh, I know that there might be an hardware issue or something, which I know it. Uh, how can I guide it to make sure that it happens only to node one? Like, you, have to, you have to shut down your scan on node one. Okay. You have to stop your scan on node one and you should run only on node two. Okay, apart from that, is there any parameter I can set it to move it to the particular node? No, no, no parameter. Again, like that, you have to use something called services and that service is a different concept and you have to define the services and your client has to use the service name. And in that service name, whether you want to connect to both the nodes or you want to connect to only one node in the service, you can define it. That means the DB administrator will not have the control on the scan to how it acts. Scan activates. you can scan nobody can control oh. at the built-in. Yep. I have one question. Uh, I see in your TNS names dot aura you uh, use the sit name. Mm -hmm. uh, sit so service name. It's, it's not a okay. It's a my bad. It's not a sit name. It's a service name. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Service Sorry, name. Okay. It's a service name. Yeah. Yeah. It should be a service name. Yeah, it's not a set. If you make it a set, it'll always go to that that particular SID. Uh, is there any standard like if, if I'm going for more than two nodes, I should have uh, more than five scans or what is the standard to set up a scan? Like three, like, like... three is a default standard. Like even if you can go with the uh, Two node cluster, three node cluster, eight node cluster, three is bare minimum. Uh, that is more than enough. And if you go with the five, seven, nine, then again, no use. Like three is the minimum. It can serve n number of connections. You no need to go more than three. Is there any way, is there any log I can see that I exactly now which connect, which node it will connect to the next or something like scan activities, scan working activities? So you, you cannot predict that. it. You cannot predict the future connections. You can. You can you can tell or you can know what are connected, which nodes are having load, but you don't know. Uh, that is instantaneous, right? You are like right now you are seeing a uh, forty percent load on node one, and then ten percent on load two, and obviously like you know the next connection go to node two, but within a fraction of second the forty percent load may come down to five percent, right? You cannot predict the future connection. Do you have any log to check the scan activities? Like if one, someone tells me that at 4, 10.30, my connection went down, like uh, apart from the alert log, like uh, I just wanted to know that on which node it connected at that time, like uh, like which uh, exactly, like is there any way I can track it at that time? If some client tells me that at 10.30, I feel that uh, uh, my uh, my system did not work well. I can see that it did not connect. I know that uh, the failover will happen, like which node failover happened? Is there any scan? log i can check it and i can understand yeah. there, there are scan logs in your diag directories you can track it out all those do we use track. it on a regular basis or is it is it something that uh, that day? is not is that is not needed at all like client will not be aware that you know whether yeah that activities a, will happen so simultaneously that it's a fraction of second like you know within few milliseconds if it's not able to connect to node this ip and you're going to go to second ip the scan it's fraction of second, milliseconds. So there's no point of tracking that one. If the client is not able to connect for 30 minutes or five minutes, then it makes sense to go ahead and then track it out. If it is just like millisecond, if he's not able to connect, maybe this IP is busy and then it is gonna fail over to second IP. And what's the point in tracking that millisecond, right? So scan will handle that connections. Okay. And is there any standard that all the three uh, scans which you set up needs to be in a uh, single subset or something, or I can? It should be on the same network. It should be on the same network. Okay. Right. All right. So that's about your uh, scan. Why scan? 
and then how that uh, uh, networking and these are the bare minimum IP what we discussed one two three one two three on each node and three per scan nine is the IP what mandatorily needed and if I can go here um, I have the, okay this slide okay let's go here all right, let's go here. Check it out. This one. Uh, same thing, right? Whatever we talked yesterday, three tier architecture: your front end, and middle tier, and your back end. And uh, if you see my scan IPs, same series: one ninety two, one sixty eight, one dot, two hundred, three hundred, four hundred, and that's what my incoming connections will take any one of that IP that's called client side load balancing the scan whatever the three IPs we can call it as a client side load balancing right and then client may connect from mobile or URL or internet or desktop or whatever the client connections it will go to application server in that application server we're going to give that a TNS name your application server we're going to give the TNS name that TNS name will be pointing to my scan name Right, so scan is a single client name. So that's why a scan name IP will be resolved with any one of that. Whatever we are seeing these IPs, client connection will go to any one of these IPs. Right. So once the client connection will go to any one of these IPs and it will pick up 200 and it's gonna connect to my any one of the cluster node. I have node one, node two, node three, node four, four nodes, and then I have node IP, that's a physical IP, 101, two three, four, and each of these four nodes have a physical IP, sorry, VIP, uh, five, 105, 106, 107, and 108. And why are this scan name? The first connection will go to node one, and second connection will go to node two, third connection will go to node four, and fourth connection will go to node four, something like that. And that is, that will always connect to your VIPs. And if this client is connected to node one, and he can access to my database, in suppose this particular node goes down, cluster node goes down, this physical IP will go down, and this VIP, right? Whatever this VIP, node one VIP will be floating in your cluster. So any one of this existing three node, it will pick up that one and it will want to connect to that client connections. That's called transparent application failover, TAF. And then same thing goes to your other node as well. If any of the client connected here, if this node goes down, and this physical IP will go down and this virtual IP will be floating under your cluster. And then this client, this connection may go to node three or node two or whatever the existing node based upon the load, right? So that's how this node four VIP will tag to this one VIP four and then node one VIP will be tagged to this node two, right? So that is your load balancing as well as your transparent application failover. And then we have this interesting network, right? The private network. If I can go here, whatever this private network, private network. And we talked about this should be a separate subnet and why we need that network. What's the advantage of that network, right? That network, we can call it as a interconnect. What is that interconnect? What that mean by interconnect? That will be like used for uh, something called, we can say here, cache fusion, right? So something called cache fusion, common questions in most of the interview, what is cache fusion? So what that mean by cache fusion, um, client one connected, and then he did a select star form employee, right? So this employee, table he read and this employee table came and sit under this particular instance one buffer cache in buffer cache of instance one this employee table data is fetched from this database and then it's kept under this buffer cache and client two will connect and then he connected to node two and he's going to run the same query select star from employee table right and then his connection there's no point of going to disk reading that employee table and bringing it here on the second instance buffer cache. So instead of reading the disk, because 
reading and writing to the disk is always costlier. So what this does, this particular instance to directly send a request to instance one. Do you have this employee table in your buffer cache? Yes, I have it already. It's queried by one of the client. So directly this buffer cache, the blocks, everything will be transferred to from instance one to instance two, from memory to memory, from RAM to RAM, very, very faster, huge speed. So that's called cache fusion. So transferring the block or transferring the data between between the instances, that's called your cache fusion. So the second client directly connect to instance two and then you can query to second first instance. Do you have this table here in your metadata? Do you have table this in your buffer cache? Here? Yes, I have it. It's gonna send the blocks and then directly result will be given back to that user. So that's called your cache fusion. Again, many people, uh, it'll, again, how it will works, that will be depend upon something called, um, there's something called G R D, global resource directory. Global resource directory is the one which will be managed by master node, right? Out of these two nodes, any one will be master. If you have four node, five node cluster, any one will be master node, act as a master node. And that master node will be having this GRD, global resource directory. What that means, this global resource directory will be contain which instance, what all the blocks are available in the buffer cache. And if any instance needs that buffer block, automatically this master will send that uh, block with help of that cache fusion. Right? Again, we'll talk more on that GRD and master table, but for now cache fusion means transferring the blocks between the instance buffer cache to buffer cache. So very, very speed. Rather than accessing from the disk, directly you can access it from the buffer cache if it is already available in any one of the instance. So that will be established with the help of this private network with this interconnect, right? So that is only for node to node communication. If this node one has already data with this network, it will transfer the data. Right, that's a use case of your uh, private network. Otherwise, this private network will be like no use at all. It's only for that cluster node to node communication. Right, again, there are like other use cases for your private network, something called uh, we can say disk heartbeat check and network heartbeat check. So, disk heartbeat check, network heartbeat check, everything is going to happen with private network. Right, we'll talk more on that. Or what is this heartbeat check? What is network heartbeat check? And again, there's something called split brain syndrome uh, that will be decided by this private network. Right, so that's about uh, uh, networking and the scan and VIPs. Uh, yeah, let, let's talk about just one more concept for today. Um, I can say startup sequence or like yeah we can just talk about startup sequence and then we can stop it here what is that startup sequence probably we'll go back here okay yeah this is your uh single page where you can understand your entire cluster startup sequence or any any questions so far let's take uh, one or two minutes and then anyone has any questions i just uh ask here otherwise we can start with the next topic. Malik, like a uh, client should be given scan, right? Right. Always, so, always scan. Okay, where the scan should be mentioned? In your client TNS files, in your application connections, wherever client want to connect, always they should use that scan name. Uh, could you please show me a demo where it is? Where it is, like. It will be in your client location, right? Client where, how the application is connected. I can show you one client name. Uh, I can go to my CD network admin. I can say can TNS names. So uh, this is my scan name here. DevDB, I want to connect. And then this is my scan name. So in TNS, if he's using a TNS files, he should give this particular scan name to him. And if he's oh. using some application ODBC, JDBC connection, he should use his scan name for connection. Okay. okay. Right. Whereas in, whereas in stand, uh, standalone, uh, uh, host name should be mentioned, right? Yeah, in standalone, it will be like host name or the IP address. Okay. Thanks. Right. Malik, during this course, you, we, will, we will be building a, a rack. Yeah, that's a, right. That's a, we discussed yesterday. That's our, my, 
that's going to take around 10 hours. That's your first step of this course. Okay. Right, let's go here. Again, go back to that course curriculum. And then this is like, we're going to start with the Linux building, followed by network building, and followed by your shared disk creation, because you're going to create this shared disk. You have to attach it to both the server. And followed by your run Cluffy check. And we're going to install your cluster where here. And you are going to install my Oracle uh, cluster database, Rack Home, and then Rack database here. That will be first basics. Do I need a special version for virtual books? Do I need to what? Come again? Uh, uh, a special version. I have 6.1 installed like, now for virtual books. Virtual books. Yeah, yeah. 6.1 is the latest one. That's That's fine. Okay. And also I subscribed yesterday for the course, but yeah, we, I did not receive anything yet. Uh, via email yeah, ping, or... ping, ping me on my WhatsApp. I can, I can communicate further. Yeah. You okay. have my okay. WhatsApp number, right? Like you can ping me after this course. Okay. All right. Uh, hello, Malik. Yep. Uh, my doubt is uh, if we are using the scan IPs for the client connections. Right. So at the time of, if any, in any case, uh, any one of the node went down, at the time, a failover where, uh, feature also worked with the scan IP or at the time the VIP came to the picture? Again, like important point, whether you are going to use a VIP or whether you're going to use the scan, the moment you connect to scan, via scan, it'll go to your VIP. From VIP, it'll want to connect to node. Right, whether you can use a VIP or whether you can use a scan, always connection will have established with the VIP. Okay. Right. So if your node goes down, your VIP will be failed over to node two. Okay, okay, I understand. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Quickly, uh last topic we can quickly touch with five, ten minutes and then we can close it. Uh your startup sequence, uh again. We'll go in details once we start the actual course, but in simple words, your cluster where startup has four sequences, level one, level two, level three, and level four. And in level one, before that level one, there's something called OHD, OHSD, Oracle High Availability Service Daemon, OHASD, right? So that's a core fundamental service which will be associated with each node. In this node one, we have OHSD. For this one, we have OHASD, Oracle High Availability Service Demon, and we have OHASD, Oracle High Availability Service Demon. Both the node will be having its own OHSD service. That's the first service, the moment you do CRS, it will start CRS. I'm going to set the environment to dot or env plus asm crsctl stat resource hyphen t hyphen init. Right. So these are your cluster services, your asm cluster interconnects and crf, crsd, cssd, cssd monitor, ctssd, discmon, sfs driver. EVMD, GIPCD, GPNPD, MD, NSD, and storage. So these are your cluster resources. And then each node will be having its own resources. Like you know, these are resources spread across all the nodes. Like if I can go to node two, if I run the same command, plus ASM2, sorry, plus ASM2, CRS, CTL, that resource hyphen t hyphen in it right same thing asm cluster interconnect crs uh, crf crsdc cssd cluster synchronization service daemon cssd monitor ctssd cluster time synchronization service daemon discmon sfs driver event uh, manager gipcd grid plug and play a uh, gpnpd grid plug and play gipcd and mdnsd and storage so all these are like cluster resources spread across your cluster and both the nodes will be able to see those resources. And very first service which is get started is your OHSD, Oracle High Availability Service Demon. 
And again, in order to start this OHSD, we have something called OLR, Oracle Local Registry. So again, you can find your OLR details from your CAT, ETC, Oracle, sorry, CAT, ETC, Oracle, right? And then inside that you have your OLR.LOC. Again, these are all binary files. You cannot read that. OLR.LOC, uh, OCR.LOC. Uh, yeah, we can, you can, it's not a binary file, but you can cat them. It will see, it will tell you where is your OLR file location, what's your CRS home. And same thing goes to your OCR. And then again, it will tell you where is your OCR location and all. Uh, the point here is the first basic service, the moment you start your cluster where your OHST will get started. I can quickly show that one. I can shut down my cluster and I can quickly show that one here. CRS CTL, stop CRS hyphen F. I'm going to stop my cluster first. And then after that, I'm going to start my cluster. The moment you start your cluster, the first service will get started is your OHST. With the help of OLR, it's going to start the OHST service on that particular node. And followed by, you're going to start your four services in your level one, CSHD agent, Vara agent and Vara root agent and CSHD monitor. Let it get down here and then we can start it in a minute. Right. Right. So everything is down. You can try to do that uh, CRCTL status. So it's going to fail. Like cluster cannot communicate. And then PSFNEF grep D dot bin. Right. Nothing is running. So I'm just going to do CRSCTL start start CRS. Just simple command CRSCTL start CRS. You're going to start your cluster resource. The moment I do start this one with the help of OLR, first service is going to start is OHST followed by your all the the first level of services OHST span. This OHST service will span all the services. Your Vara root agent, Vara agent, and CSHD agent and CSHD monitor. I'm going to do start CRS it will start CRS. And then once you do that, you can monitor using the same command CRS it will start resource hyphen T hyphen in it. And you can see right now EVMD is getting started here and run that command again. EVMD is intermediate. CSST is getting starting now. And it will be keep on monitoring the same command and which service is getting struck. You have to check for the respective log. Right now you can see this is online, CSHD is online. Now it is starting your cluster interconnect. Right, so that's online. Now it is starting your CRSD. Right, CRSD is intermediate. So most of the services are online now here. And last service is your CRSD here. Right, everything is online now. And you can check PSF and EF grep S mode and not yet TSM is not yet came up. Right, the moment you can see all the services are online, back online, that's well and good. So you don't need to worry, your cluster is fine. This one, like your ASM is back online finally. So how this startup sequence worked here, it based upon this particular slide here, see. Your OHST service, that is your core service. First, it will get started on that server using OLR. And the moment OHST service starts, internally it's going to start four services. Your CSHD agent, CSHD monitor, CSHD monitor, and let's go here. Tap PSFNEF grep D dot bin. And your uh, CSHD, this is the first service, OHST bin. First, it's going to get started. And once it gets started, and then your uh, CSHT agent, and then followed by your CSHT monitor, the agent as well as monitor. That's what it's going to first get started. CSHT agent followed by your CSHT monitor. Along with that, Vara root agent and Vara agent. So we can see here uh, Vara root agent and Vara agent. These are the two services will get started along with this CSHT agent and CSHT monitor. Right, and then this Vara root agent and Vara agent internally starts remaining services. 
what are those this vara root agent you going to start these services your cssd and crsd and ctssd disk mount and acfs driver and if you can go here crsd cssd and disk mount acfs driver so these are the services get started with the help of this vara root agent and with the help of this vara agent and these are the services will get started your asm gipcd gpnpd evmd and mdnsd so your evmd gipcd and gpnpd and mdnsd so these are the services which will get started with this particular vara agent right these are like your services which will get started and your crsd whatever this main service right that is a cluster synchronization service demon which is responsible for starting two more agents that's called again vara agent and vara vara root agent and vara agent and these are vara agent and vara root agent internally starts your all the cluster resources and the node specific uh, resources like you know your cluster resources are your gns your acfs registry your scan your gns your node vip node ips physical ips and your asm instance ons eons gsd listeners and scan listeners services and database instances and disk groups all this like cluster resources and node specific resources everything will be get started at your final stage right these are your cluster demons which will get started at your phase 2 right and then at the main core fundamental services are two here out of this all the services two main core fundamental services one is your ohst oracle high availability service demon which depends upon your olr and second service is your crst cluster uh, uh crst cluster ready services uh, which is depending upon your um, ocr ocr is inside your disk group which is going to read that ocr and it's going to start your all the cluster resources and remaining databases with help of your uh, or agent and or root agent so these are very very mandatory or like troubleshooting most of the times when your cluster is not starting so most of the times we are going to see this crsd cluster ready service demon log and my ohst service log and then this ohst depend upon olr that's a basic file and the crsd depend upon my ocr right so that's a high level overview again we can go more in deep where are these log files and if i do this crctl start crs right i did the crctl start crs here and then if this particular crsd and getting started and it will be stuck in starting only and it may be offline or it may be intermediate so in that case my job is to go to crsd log and check for that log file why it is not starting and if that same cluster startup is stuck at gipcd here and if it is a intermediate and if it is not starting and then I, my job is to go to this gipcd log and check why it is stuck and what is the error the respective log you have to go and then check it out and then troubleshoot that uh, that's going to give you the particular direction why it is not starting and all right uh, any questions here on this uh, slide because it's just a high level overview i wanted to give it malik uh, oil copy of ocr itself right like why no that no OLR is different and OCR is different. Okay. In case if my uh, in case if my uh, any uh, like uh, CRF service is not started, uh, is there any way I can start it individually, or I need to shut down? You can down start. You cluster? can start individually. If your CRST is not starting, you can start CRST separately. Your CTSST not starting means you can start it separately. I think you can I do. do it on only one node also, or if I start it, it needs to be started on both the nodes, like it, which is on offline. One it's on node they're not specific they're not specific yeah what does that observer and state observer and stable means in the status like uh, when exactly it comes as observer and you have something that's again trickiest word right it's a cluster time synchronization service so what that mean i have my node one and i have my node two you see my node one and i have node two and then we most of the organization they use something called n sorry ntp they will use something called ntp network time protocol uh, and then that will be coming from your dns server 
so that dns server the ntp means your time zone like you know you're going to set the time here you're going to you're going to set the time ist and then same thing ntp is going to set the time here ist so ist indian standard time or if it's from est time zone you're going to set the time zone as a est eastern time zone you're going to set the time zone on this server as a est so if this both the servers time is exactly matching if you're using ntp server then obviously time will be matching and then no job of this ctss cluster time sequence service this service is kind of a useless no job for this one it will be like observer mode it will just go on sleeping state because you already servers both the nodes are in sync so this service will be like useless <clears throat> in case your est time zone it is 12 o'clock here and due to some error and it lagging one hour 11 am <clears throat> give me a second right sorry for that right so if there is a time lag or time delay between both the cluster nodes and then because of some ntp issue and all then this particular service become active this become active and then this become stable and this become online so it will ignore this ntp and this become active and this will make sure that your cluster is in same time even though nodes are in different time having one hour lag or two hour lag your ctsht will make sure that cluster nodes are in same time Right. That sometimes most of the times you can see observer mode because most of the organization they will use NTP. All the server will be on the same time zone and same timing. Right. So this CTSD will come into picture only if there's any issue with your NTP. Otherwise, it will be like observer mode. And then this disk mode it shows offline. That means that it is the disk the mode will be used only in Exerator. Normal server will not use the disk mode. Okay. Where I collect that this one will be used, but here normal servers will never be used. And it will be always in an AS. Is there any uh, process related to the ASM over here? Like, uh, like how we can know that whether both the ASM disks are fine or not with the help of this command CRS? Uh, no, you have to use something the same command CRSTL start resource instead of hyphen in it, you have to remove that hyphen in it. And if you run that one, it's going to give you your uh, data disk group which is online on both the nodes and your OCR disk group, which is online on both the nodes and your record disk group, which is online on both the nodes. Right, you have to remove that hyphen. Hyphen init is for your cluster startup troubleshooting. If you remove this hyphen init, like if you run same CRSTL stat resource hyphen T, it will be entire cluster resource for your two node clusters, your scan, your scan one, scan two, scan three. Your scan one and two is running on, scan one is running on node one, scan two and three are running on node two. And your node one VIP, node two VIP running on node one and node two. Your dev DB, both are online on node one and node two. Your dev database, which is offline, not running at the moment. And your ASM listener, and your ASM instance, and your record is group, OCR disk group and your scan listener and your scan one listener, second listener, third listener running on node one and node two and node two. And again, ASM listener, net listener and your node specific that ASM specific listener and database specific listener, all those things you can, you can verify. All right, let's uh, Stop it here. If anyone has any last moment, last moment questions, queries, feel free to ask. I have right. one quick question. So yep. Oracle local registry, right? Let's say if somebody removed that local registry, is there a backup of that one that I can restore? That you have to take a backup on a regular basis. So OCR, Oracle takes a backup on its own, right? But right. OLR, I have to manually take a backup? Right, that's correct. Okay. Malik, like if CRS is not coming up while doing it, uh, I mean, how to find the location of the CRS? Lock location of? Lock file location. Again, the... we'll talk more on troubleshooting part. As, as I said, you have to run this command, CRSTL stat resource hyphen and okay. which service is not starting, you have to go to the respective log and you have to troubleshoot that. All the logs will be available in diag location and you can get it over there. And simple uh, ways. 
simple ways I can tell you CRST, right? Like you can do locate CRST dot TRC, right? So this is your location. Oh. Right, so you can go here in this location and you can see all the log files. Your CRST, CTSD, all the log file location, you can, it'll be like same path okay. on the diag path. Okay, if the, uh, if node one goes down due to some issue like you mentioned network or uh, uh, OS uh, issue, uh, like how to find what to do, what is the cause of the issue? Okay, and that's uh, not an easy job, right? Like you have to troubleshoot. So there are so many logs you have to check it out. Your ASM log, your node log, your CRST log. And okay. yeah, then you can find out what's the root cause, whether it's a disk heartbeat or whether it's a network heartbeat or whether it's a packet drop, all those things you have to analyze. Okay, thank you. All right. Because uh, uh, Marika, the last time I have heard that like OCR, uh, o OLR is a copy of an OCR, but you wouldn't- uh, OLR, what, come again, come again? Like OLR, like Oracle Local Registry is mm -hmm. a copy of an OCR, which has been present in a no, uh, local no, node, right? No, no, no. Because the copy of both- will OLR be... is different, OCR is different. Both are not mm -hmm. independent, both are independent of each other. There's not a copy of each other. It's not a copy at all. OLR is different and OCR is different. Okay, 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 okay. okay. And then OCR is dependent on CRST demon and OHSG is dependent on OLR, okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah, hello. Yeah, Malik. Yep. Yeah, actually, I have a small doubt. Yeah, uh, what is the difference between the 11G and 19C in the cluster level? Cluster level, it's all same. There is no same. difference. At all. There, there are like few improvement in the cluster level. In 12C, mm -hmm. they introduced with something called flex cluster, mm -hmm. and which is not available in your 11G. And okay. What exactly that flex cluster? Let's uh, give some idea uh, in one slide here. Um, right, what is that flex cluster? So far, what we understand, normal scenario. I have my node one, I have my node two, node three, node four. So far, what we know, my ASM one will run here, ASM two will run here, ASM three will run here, ASM four will run here. Similarly, my database one instance, database two instance, my database three instance will run here, my database four instance will run here. That's a normal architecture. But when it comes to flex, so I no need to run this ASM instance here. I'll just only one ASM instance on node four, and then I can run my databases on all the four nodes. So if this database want to communicate, you're gonna make use of only one ASM instance. You can run only one ASM instance, or two ASM instance and whichever node you want and remaining node you can just run the database. Like I can say, I'll just run my, I'll just shut down my three ASM instance. I'll run only ASM instance on node four and my run database instance on node one, node two and node three, right? I can run my database instance here so that all three node completely resources used by my database instance here, right? So I can separate my database ASM instance on separate node by database instance, I can run it on separate node. So that's called something flex cluster or flex ASM, you can say. That's one of the feature. Like architecture wise, the remains same. The startup sequence, shutdown sequence, whatever we talked. But okay. these are the new features added to that cluster where. <clears throat> Is it optional option, uh, feature or we can use mandatory? In 12C, it's optional. Either you can go with the flex or you can go without flex. But in 19C, it's a default. So default flex, sir. Huh? Yeah. Again, yeah. this is just left to you. Your ASM default will be running on all nodes, but you can shut down your ASM on whatever node you want it. You can just shut it down. Flex will be default enabled in 19C. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but uh, Malik, like, I want to understand that in case of that A4, which is running at the cluster level, only one ASM, if that fails, how is that, that will, that will work? Like, uh, because that fails, there is no redundancy, down, right? There if is that no... fails, there's a downtime, your entire cluster will go down. That means how exactly it has contributed? No, like I like, said, you, saving, like, you can run, you can run your ASM instance on all four nodes. You can run your ASM instance on three nodes. You can run it on two nodes. You can run it on one node. There is no restriction at all. That's the meaning of flex. That left to you whether you can run it on one node, you have to take that risk. You can run it on two node, you have to take that risk. You can run it on all four nodes, it's well and good. And that's a flex feature is available. You can use that. 
the only advantage you can get is saving the resources by uh, by taking the risk of in case of something goes wrong yeah you can make it two node you can run your asm on node 3 and 4 and you can run your database on 1 and 2 because asm first of all consumes less resources right like why how exactly it has been contributed so much that, yeah. that's yeah that's uh, that's one of the feature you can if needed you can use it otherwise not an issue mostly like so far whatever i worked very rare customer is there any io improvement will happen from that or something apart from resource saving because uh, it should uh, really help serve the purpose right i don't see that yeah yeah no no there are like other features also with the flex but yeah this is one of the advantages what i mentioned right now okay all right uh, like what is uh, io and how does it work io is your disk reads and writes okay any read and any write that's called io any read and write from your disk that's how it works and all again it's not it is out of our dbs scope linux admin will will come into picture that what is the command to monitor io io stat just io stat yeah Again, I was chat with a lot of uh, parameter you can pass it. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's stop it here now. We'll we'll connect on on next weekend with the regular classes, guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Malik. Thank you. Thank you, Malik. Yeah. Thank you all. Bye.